Okay, now, um, so we've established that we can study the stability of this because it's a two dimensional system. And I want to emphasize that the main parameter I'm going to use in what I talk about today, the rest of the day, the main parameter I'm going to use, there's two main parameters I'm interested in. One is the current because that's one that's really easy to manipulate by the experimentalist. And the other thing I'm going to be interested in is roughly the time scale of the potassium, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? So I want to go back. Let me now look at two-dimensional systems, planar systems. I want to introduce some very useful con um, concepts, okay? And so we're going to have dx dt equals f of x y. Or, you know what? I'll keep the same notation here. Uh oh, where's the eraser? Here. dv dt equals f of v n, and v n dt equals g of v n. Okay. So that's a differential equation in two dimensions. And you're probably used to plotting things as a function of time. But it's actually mathematically convenient to think of things in what's called the phase space. Okay, The phase space of this system is two dimensional because everything is determined by two variables. The phase space of Hodgkin Huxley is four dimensional. And if we draw a plane here, N and V, okay, then we could talk about an equilibrium point as being some point on this plane, okay? And if we start with some initial condition, say over here, we could ask what the fate of that initial condition is. Does it, you know, maybe spiral in or something like this? Spiraling in would mean that it has complex eigenvalues and it comes in, right? So what we can do is first start with linear systems. Let me just start with a linear system, okay? So A, B, C, and D are parameters, and X equals zero is an equilibrium point, okay? And I want to sketch what this looks like depending on the nature of the eigenvalues. <laughs> so let's suppose, for example, that the determinant is negative and the trace is positive. Yes? Huh? The equilibrium, does it have to be a point? Can't it be a line? It can be a line that's very degenerate. It's a line if AD minus BC is zero, okay? But if I change that, that's a de that, that is a very degenerate system. It means there's a zero eigenvalue, but in general, what we say mathematically, generically, you won't have that. So now, let's, let's look at what happens here, okay? Suppose case one, AD minus BC less than zero, okay? That's the easiest case. Remember, that was the whole plane, whole lower plane. Remember in our trace determinant plane over here, At this picture, remember? Okay. And over here, um, the term it was negative one positive eigenvalue, one negative eigenvalue. Well, if there's a positive eigenvalue, then there's an eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. Let me draw that eigenvector. Let's suppose that's the eigenvector corresponding to the positive eigenvalue. 
Okay? And since it's a positive eigenvalue and it's an eigenvector, it means it's preserved. A, B was land. So if we start on the eigenvector, we'll stay on the eigenvector for all time, and we'll go out. Because it's a positive eigenvalue, right? Does that make sense? So if I start anywhere on here, then I'll stay on there because if I start with, um, suppose I start with x, y equals v, where v is this eigenvalue, vector, then remember the general solution, we have a, v equals lambda v, then the solution to this is x, y equals v, e to the lambda t. So we'll stay on there. Always stay. This is always this. This is this line is no matter what lamp, no matter what t is, it's always just constant times that vector. Okay, so that's the positive eigenvalue, and ah, here's the color chart. There we go. And let's suppose the negative eigenvalue. Or a negative eigenvector, the eigenvector corresponding to a negative eigenvalue. I just drawn it like this. It doesn't have to be like that, but it's that's going to go in like this. Okay. So now, what happens off of that? Well, you can kind of see what's going to happen. If I start near here. I have to go down, and then as I get close to this, I go out. So solutions are going to look like this in the plane. If I start with this initial condition, I'll start decaying along this eigenvector and then go out. Start near here, go out like that. So this is called a saddle point. You guys, saddle, you know what a saddle looks like? It looks like this. So a marble on a saddle comes in along this direction and goes out along the other direction. Okay? Mathematicians have a name for this and for this. This is called the stable set or stable manifold. And this is the unstable set. In a nonlinear system, these things will curve around in all kinds of crazy ways. Okay, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so this is a saddle. That face plane looks like this. Now let's think of a case where um, case two, two positive eigenvalues. Okay. Two negative eigenvalues will look exactly the same, just everything gets reversed in time. Does that make sense? Because if I go backwards in time, positive eigenvalues are like negative eigenvalues. Yes? Okay. So let's do that case. Case two. Um, again, let's suppose we have two eigenvectors corresponding to the two positive eigenvalues. All right. Draw the two eigenvectors, but now they're both pointing out, right? Because they're positive eigenvectors. And if I start on one, I'll stay on them. But now I want to emphasize that suppose that this one has a big positive eigenvalue and it has a small positive eigenvalue. So I'm going to indicate that by putting a double arrow on here, because he goes out really fast. And on this guy, I'm going to put a single eigen, um, single guy, he goes slow. So I'm going to go out much slower here than on this guy. And what does the face plane look like then? Okay. Then, I 
hate drawing nodes. So it looks like that. That's what the face plane looks like. Everything goes out, okay? And case two, case two prime, <laughs> two negative eigenvalues, looks exactly the same, but everything's reversed, okay? Just change the sign of the arrows. This is called a node. And if it's positive, it's called an unstable node. And if it's negative, then it's called a stable node. Okay? This has a two-dimensional unstable space. In this case, it's the whole plane. If you had a three-dimensional system, you could have two unstable directions and one stable direction. And that's kind of a saddle. Things will come in along the stable one and then spew out along the unstable one. Or you could have two stable directions and one unstable. So things will come in here and then go out the unstable one. So I want you to think about these things geometrically. So I stick with planes because it's much easier to do. All right, so these guys, stable node, unstable node. So that leads case three. Complex So let's suppose they're positive. Okay? Then we know that the solutions are exponentials times sines and sines. Right? So things are X might be looking like that, and Y might like look like that. Okay? Exponentially growing and oscillating. So in the plane, what does it look like? Things spiral out. Okay? Now, they might spiral clockwise or counterclockwise. How do you know which one it is? Well, let me do an example in a second. So this would be, this is called an unstable spiral, of course. And case, this is case three, case three prime is complex conjugate negative eigenvalues, and that's called a stable spiral. And just things go in the other direction. Okay? You go clockwise, counterclockwise. <clears throat> Depending on what side of the equator you're on. Oh, that's a joke. That's a myth, too. Okay? And then case, case four, zero eigenvalue. Okay? That's his case. All right? Then, a lot of equilibrium points, okay? Everywhere along there is, that's the eigenvector corresponding to the zero eigenvalue. There's a line of equilibrium points. Unless the other eigenvalue is negative, then you get something that looks like that. I think it just comes in, okay? And of course, if it's zero and negative, or zero and positive, then everything gets reversed. And finally, case five, imaginary eigenvalue, okay? Then you get what's called centers. And you get a series of closed curves because everything's just pure trick functions, cosines and sines, and you get ellipses. How do you know whether it's comp? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll we're going to do phase planes in just a second, null lines and direction fields, and that'll help us determine. Okay. So what's really cool is this: this is what the phase plane looks like for a linear system. Okay. But 
what about a nonlinear system? Well, near an equilibrium point, near an equilibrium point, there's a theorem that says the behavior near an equilibrium point is the same as the behavior of the corresponding linear system. As long as the eigenvalues don't have zero real parts. So what that means is that if we have many equilibrium points, we could just focus in on their zoom in. And I know all you guys know what zoom is because you've got phones. And so you sit there like this and you zoom in and everything nonlinear looks linear if you get close enough to it, okay? Except in these cases where there is zero eigenvalues. So near an equilibrium point that has, when you linearize, has one positive eigenvalue, one negative eigenvalue, it looks like a center. I mean, it looks like a saddle point. And nearby you have the stable and unstable subspaces, okay, which in this case become manifolds because they're not just straight lines anymore, okay? They're like straight lines locally, but they aren't, okay? So really, what we have to do is find the equilibrium points, determine their stability, and then we know what everything looks like near the equilibrium point. So let's, let's apply that to our, before we get to the morris lecar equations, I want to apply that to our um, fox and rabbit, ah, there's the eraser, fox and rabbit case, okay? So remember our foxes and rabbits, x dot equals x times y minus x minus y. Okay. Remember that? Okay. Got the one correct this time. Okay. And the equilibrium were zero, zero. And the matrix for zero, zero, if I recall, was one. 0, 0, minus 1 half, okay? And there was an equilibrium 1, 0, okay? And that case, the equilibria, or what was, um, does anybody, can somebody get in their notes and tell me what the matrix was? Um, I think this is 1 half, and this is minus 1, and I think this is 1, and this is 0. Is that correct? Yeah. What's well, a saddle also? Right? One positive eigenvalue, one negative eigenvalue. And then the other guy was one half, one half. And that was, um, let's see, zero minus one half. What was, was this? Can you guys remind me what it was here? Huh? Minus a half. And a half? Yeah, there we go, okay? So, we know this is a saddle. We know this is a saddle. Let's figure this guy out. Trace is minus one half. Determinant is one fourth. Trace squared minus four times the determinant is less than zero, okay? So that means the eigenvalues have negative, it's inside that parabola. So that means they're negative eigenvalues and they're spirals, okay? So, if we go over, if we kind of sketch what this guy has to look like, haven't filled the sketch in yet. Why? or x, y, we have an equilibrium point at zero, we have an equilibrium point here, and we have an equilibrium point here, okay? For this guy, looks like that. 
That's easy to see because <laughs> the eigenvector corresponding to 1 <laughs> is the x-axis, and the eigenvector corresponding to minus half is the y-axis because it's a diagonal matrix. It's not so straightforward here, but you can do that to show that this guy looks like that, and then there's the eigenvector for this looks like that. <laughs> Figure out what the eigenvector corresponding to the positive eigenvalue for this is. Okay, positive eigenvalue is one half, and so you should be able to figure that out. Okay, looks like that. And up here, it's some sort of spiral, but it spirals in, right? So we don't know whether it spirals this way, or maybe it spirals this way. So how do we do that? We have to figure that out. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce something called the con a concept called direction fields. Direction fields are great. They're like a little mini GPS for your computer, for your phase plane. Okay, for your for your dynamical system. That's all they are. They're telling you locally at each point what direction you're going to go. Okay, so let's think about that. Oh, I've erased that, but that's okay. Come back to it. So if we pick a point x, y on the plane, let's pick some arbitrary point, and we evaluate f at that point, and evaluate g, it will tell us what direction dx dt is and what direction dy dt is. Okay? Those are tangents to the curves that fill out the plane. Right? Remember that from calculus. If you have a parametric curve x of t, y of t, then dx dt and dy dt is the tangent. Right? So, if we can figure out the sign of f and g, then we'll know what direction things are going. Make sense? So let's think about that. I'm going to write a little picture here. And I'm going to write f greater than 0, f equals 0, f less than 0, g greater than 0, g equals 0, g less than 0. Okay. So if g and f are both positive, that means x is increasing, dx dt is positive, and y is increasing. So the arrow has to look like that. Okay? So this is going to Naga land. Okay? I think that's right, isn't it? Naga land in the northeast? I only know that because I grow chilies, and the Naga viper is from Naga land. Okay? g greater than 0, f equals 0, all right? And that's going to the Bay of Bengal. I'm going to really quickly run out of my um, Indian geography in a second, but okay? Australia? <laughs> Maybe. All right. I would say in Florida if I was in the United States, okay? But anyway, so g greater than zero, oh, okay, I've screwed this up because I usually do f, okay, let me get this right, okay? g greater than zero, f equals zero means x isn't changing and y is going up. I, I messed this up, sorry. I usually have g here and f there, okay? So we are going, here we're going to like Pakistan or something. Right. Here, what happens there? G is greater than zero, so Y is increasing, and it's going to go this way, right? Everybody see? All right. G equals zero, and F greater than zero, then it has to go that way, right? G equals zero, F equals zero. Holy cow, that's an equilibrium point, right? 
So we'll just make a little dot there. Okay? And g equals 0, f less than 0, which way is that going? That has to go that way, right? Because f negative means dx dt is negative, and y isn't changing because g is 0. So let's fill the rest of this out. g negative, f positive. It's going to go g negative, so y is decreasing. Yep, exactly, you got it. Goes this way, right? This goes this way, and there's only one left, okay? G negative, F negative, okay? Everybody's going that way, okay? So Kerala, um, <laughs> Punjab, um, uh, Chennai, <laughs> I, I, there, I'm pretty much done. <laughs> All right, so there's the, this. So what we do is divide. So what you would want to do is at each point in the plane, draw a little dot, pick a point, and figure out, evaluate f and g at that point, and that will give you a little field, a, a little direction to go. Okay, so if it happened to go like here, suppose that it looked like that. We know things are going to go that way. Okay. You have a question, or you're just oh, you're just itching. Okay. <laughs> All right. So everybody understand that? So really, I've drawn things. All these arrows equal sizes. Really, all we care about is the sign of f and g. We don't care what their actual value is because we know, if we know what their sign is, we know what direction things are going. You know, it might be going really fast in one direction, but we, we don't care. That, that's more vertical than it is horizontal, for example. Okay? So really, how do we determine which sign f and g are? We determine where they're zero, okay? Because if we know where they're zero, then when we're on one side, we might be negative and we're positive on the other side. So, definition. Definition. The x not line is the curve where f of x, y equals 0. Okay. And the y no kind <laughs> g equals 0. Okay. So the cool thing is if those intersect if the no clines intersect that's the equilibrium points, right? Because that's f equals 0 and g equals 0. So basically, I can give you a crazy, crazy set of null clines. Say, this is the x null cline, and this is the y null cline. OK? You know exactly where all the equilibrium points are. OK? If this is the y null cline, then what direction do things have to go? They have to be parallel because that's the y dt is 0, right? And the y null cline, they have to be like this, the little hairs, like the hairs. They have to look like this, right? And then all we have to do is pick some point where we know what the sign is. Suppose that in this particular case, that I knew that the sign was this way. Okay? Then these are easy to fill in. Because if it's this way, then dy dt and dx dt had to be positive. So when we hit here, this is where dx dt is 0. dy dt has to maintain being positive because we didn't switch signs. So we put the arrows this way here. How about here? We have to go this way. And then, once we do that, then this, this changed from 
dx d, dy dt positive, dy dt zero, dy dt had to be negative on this side. So you see, all you need is one, and then the rest you fill in. It's like Sudoku for morons, okay? You guys know Sudoku? It's like if I gave you a Sudoku and I just gave you all of them but one number, okay? And you can do it, just fill the rest in. But this is better because I only have to give you one hint and then you fill in the rest of the puzzle. Okay, so let's do it to our friend, the predator prey. And we can complete the phase portrait for that. Okay, so, can you see the red and the green or, sh yes? Huh? How do you know that you change sign? Can we take a parabola that's just touching the axis? Because then there'll be a zero but it'll not change signs even after the that, that can happen that's degenerate, yeah. Okay. Typically, it won't happen. Typically, it's transversal. Okay, you're full of the, <laughs> you like those exceptions. <laughs> you must be a pure mathematician. Oh, <laughs> all right, so what is the x null cline here? When is, when is f of x zero? Well, when x equals zero, right? Dx dt is zero when x equals zero. So I can draw the x null cline right there, okay? And when else is x equals zero? X is zero when y equals one minus x. Okay? So that's the x null cline. You see that? The x dt is zero when x equals zero. That's this line, the y axis. And when x equal when y equals one minus x. Right? F of x is zero when x equals zero. Everybody cool with that? I see puzzled expressions. Huh? Okay. When is f equal to zero? f is equal to zero when x is zero or y equals one minus x. So there is x equals zero and there is y equals one minus x. Huh? Oh, you're right. Y equals one minus x doesn't look like that. <laughs> one y equals one minus x looks like <laughs> ah. <laughs> All right. Y equals one minus x looks like this. There we go. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. That's why you didn't get it. Okay. Because I'm a, uh, had a moron moment there. Okay. So now. That's the x null cline, and we can help ourselves remember that that's the x null cline by drawing little hairs to indicate that that's the x null cline. But I've colored chalk, so the x null cline will be in pink. What about the y null cline? Y null cline is y equals zero. Okay, that's this axis. Okay, and y, x equals one half, right? Okay, and now you can see everywhere, oh, and be careful, you might think, oh, isn't that an equilibrium or isn't that an equilibrium? No, because it's not a green guy intersecting a red guy, it's two red guys intersecting. This is two green guys intersecting. The equilibria are where the red and the green intersect. So now it's real easy to fill in the phase plane. Okay? We already know that this guy was going down and this guy was going across. So that means in this area, the vector field has to look like that, right? This is 
the x, this is the um, y null climb. So dy dt is changing sign here as we cross across here. So dy dt has to be going like this now. Okay? Because we've changed from one side to the other. I think I did that. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So what way does the arrow go here? Up or down? Huh? It has to go up, right? Because this is where x changes, dx dt changes side. Okay? And that means that things have to keep going this way at this point, right? Because it has to go, okay? Because it has to keep going up here because we haven't crossed, crossed the y null line. Now we've crossed the y null line again. Oh, I forgot to draw the hairs on here. Okay, so now, look at that picture. So we filled everything in. And now we know everything spirals in a counterclockwise way. So we can fill in, if I started with a whole bunch of rabbits, suppose I started with rabbits, only rabbits, okay? And I introduce a few foxes. So I start with this initial condition. What's going to happen? I'm going to go up like this, spiral in. We know we already established that this is a stable spiral. So it has to look like that. No math at all. No calculations. Easy. It's fun. It's just drawing pictures. Okay? You don't have to be a, you can even be a crappy artist like me. Okay? But you see, that's what it looks like. So what you see here is that if we, now from this you can interpret what X and Y look like. You started with X big and Y small. X of T suddenly crashes. Okay. X of T goes down and then it starts to come back up again. And Y of T goes up. Okay. And you can get that just by looking at this picture. So even though we didn't solve the differential equation, we know exactly what the solutions look like. Just because we can do this cool geometric trick. So now what I want to do for the next 47 minutes is study this equation. Okay? Using these ideas. Okay? So at this point, are there any questions? Good. All right. So I'm going to, is it okay to erase this now? Okay. Okay, I'm going to keep using, um, are, the, are those colors good or should I use different colors for the null clients? Is it better to use like yellow and blue or like green and red is okay? Okay, so just so I remember, all right, so from now on, I'm going to draw the end null cline in green, okay? And I'll draw the V null cline in pink, red. Oh, there, I got the white and the Indian flag. I, good. I, is it red, white, and green? So with some cool stuff in the middle? All right. Okay. So let's start with an N null cline. That's real easy. What is the N null cline? Dn dt is zero when n equals n infinity of v. Right? So let me draw n infinity of v. 
I'll just, so from now on, my coordinates, I'm not going to draw the coordinate axes. It's N here, V here, okay? I don't want to draw the coordinate axes because they're going to confuse you. I just want to draw null lines and direction fields, okay? So let's study this, right? And I'm going to draw some arbitrary pictures here, but I just want you to, um, but N infinity we know is going to look like this, right? So that's the N dt is zero. And so that's the N null line. So things are only going in what direction? They can only go along the V axis. So just to help you understand that, I'll do that. Now, what does the V null line look like? That is ugly, okay? But look, it's not so bad because to find the V null line, you have to set this to be zero. But if we write, we can solve for n. It's real easy to solve for n, okay? So we can solve for n. And solve for n. n equals, um, minus GL, V minus EL, minus GNA, M infinity of V, V minus ENA, plus I, divided by So you can see, as V approaches EK, there's a vertical asymptote, right? So, and when V is equal to EK, or close to EK, but bigger than EK, all right, then say it's close to EK, but bigger, okay? This is positive, and this is positive, and this is positive. So the vertical asymptote looks like this inside of that. Okay? So this like, kind of looks like this Okay, as we approach EK. You see that? There's the vertical. There's EK. Does everybody understand why that is? EK is minus 80. E is minus 60. Gives you a minus 20. GL is positive, minus, minus, positive. Same thing with all these other guys. Okay. And now what's cool is that if M is sharp, this null line can start to go up like that. Okay? And then what happens is V goes to plus infinity is that this, this goes to zero. Oh no, M infinity goes to one, right? As V goes to plus infinity. This goes, to, this settles down to a constant as V goes to plus infinity. So the null line, if GNA is big enough, the null line looks like this. And then, of course, there's a part here, which we don't care about, because that's way below EK. So all we have to do is move this over to here. So I'm going to choose a partic make a choice of parameters here. And I'm going to suppose that when I equals 0, like okay so how many equilibrium points are there hmm? one 
right there. Okay, question. Here's a cool homework problem. Is this equilibrium point stable or unstable? Can we tell just by looking? Now we know something about this system already. Remember, we know that every equilibrium point starts with this. Right? Every equilibrium point starts with that. Right? And then there's this question mark. Okay? Homework problem. Show that if the slope of the v-null climb, this is the v-null climb, remember? If the slope is, the, the, the sine of this is equal to the slope, the sine of the slope of the v-null climb. Isn't that cool? That's a little exercise for you to try, okay? Not easy, but it, it's not that hard either. So in that case, because the slope of the V-null climb is negative, this has to be stable. So let's draw what the trajectories look like for here. Okay? Let's pick a point right here. Okay? That's below here. So dn dt is positive, right? Because it's n infinity minus n. So n is small, so n infinity is big. And so dn dt is positive. And dv dt is positive. You have to believe me on that, but we're a little past equilibrium. So trajectories look like that. They go up like that. Once we know that, we get that, 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 Let's see, yeah, so we come in like this, Let's see this has to be this way, okay, so we have this picture, and now we can see how an action potential is generated, if we start kick over here, this takes us all the way around here, up here, all the way around, and then back down the rest. So the voltage goes up like that, and then comes back down. We just generated an action potential. Okay? So now, Let's inject some current into this sucker, all right? So I'm gonna inject current into this. It's gonna move this note, oh, I just erased it. If you inject current, that makes making I bigger. It pushes that null cline up. Remember, N is proportional to I over something times V minus EK, remember? Down here, so it's gonna push that null cline up, okay? It's going to push it up a lot more on this. And let's suppose it pushes it to this region. So now I'm going to draw it. I'm going to increase I. So I still have my V null climb. And now I push my voltage null climb into this region. Pushed it up. <laughs> So I have an equilibrium point here. Now we don't know its stability, do we? Because what I just said, the exercise, the slope of the V-null cline is positive here. And so therefore, this is positive. Right? And so we don't know. 
Now, here's a question. Can that equilibrium point be a saddle or not? Come on. Yes or no? It's a simple yes or no answer. Saddle, how many people think it can be a saddle? What does a saddle mean? It means the determinant is negative, right? How many equilibrium points does this system have? Only one. The steady state IV curve is monotone. We haven't ever, right? So remember the steady state IV curve is monotonically increasing. So it can all, remember the sign of the determinant is the derivative of that. Okay. Here's another fun exercise. Okay. Show that if the slope, all right, so let me, uh, there's a whole bunch of cool Klein exercises. So let me, maybe I'll move over here. Okay. Oh, incidentally, here's a couple of references for this stuff. Isakevich's book and Erman Trout and Terman's book. This one's better. Okay. If slope of V null Klein is negative, that implies stable. Okay? That's a homework problem. Here's another one. If slope of n null Klein greater than slope of v null Klein, that implies stable. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't imply stable. It implies determinant greater than zero. Okay, that's what it implies. It doesn't imply stable. It's the determinant's greater than zero. So if the determinant's greater than zero, this cannot be a saddle point, right? Um, this can't be a saddle point because the saddle point is a negative determinant. See, slope of the v null Klein is less than the slope of the end null Klein. See, you can get so much from pictures. The only question now is whether, so we know the determinant is positive. The only question is whether the trace is negative. And that is much harder. You have to actually plug in real numbers. So what I want to do now is take you through what's called a bifurcation diagram. And you're going to do this today in, in your lab. Okay. So I want to talk about what happens when my erase go. Ah. What happens is I increase the current. Okay. So as I continue to increase the current. This is just going to keep going like that. I'll never gain another equilibrium point. Suppose I have parameters like that. That means the steady state IV curve is monotonic. It never, change, it never turns around. So, so far, when we did the steady state IV curve, When we did the steady state IV curve, I wrote I steady state of V versus V. Right? And I treated V as the independent variable. So we had a curve that looked like that. And then we could pick out for each I what V was. Right? Remember? But we're going to manipulate I the parameter. So it'd be better to make i the independent variable and make v the steady, the dependent variable. So what I'm going to do is rotate this picture. 
draw along the x-axis pi and along the x-axis the value of voltage. That's all I'm doing. So I'm going to draw that curve. There it is. <laughs> did it from, I did it by looking at that equation and carefully calculating each point in my brain. Okay. So this, the axis now that you're looking at is I and V steady state, the steady state value of I. Okay. So along here, uh, each point here for each I, I have a unique voltage, okay, that's a steady state. And if I have the unique voltage, I also have a unique value for n, right, because n is n infinity of v. So I have a unique equilibrium point, n naught, v naught, and I want to do the stability. So here's what I'm going to do, and you'll see this today. As I change, what is the only way that this equilibrium point can lose stability? What's the only way? From what I've just told you. It cannot go through a zero eig, there can't be a zero eigenvalue, because remember the sign of the determinant is always positive. And remember, a zero eigenvalue occurs when the determinant is zero. Do you remember that? Remember when a matrix is invertible, <laughs> when it's Determinant is non-zero. When it's determinant zero, it's non-invertible. That's because it has a zero eigenvalue. Remember that from linear algebra? Maybe. Okay. So the only way this can lose stability is if a pair of complex conjugate eigenvalues goes from positive real part to negative, or negative real part to positive real part. Now we know for i real big, or i negative, that we're here in this picture, okay? i negative just keeps bringing this down. So we know it's stable. And for i real big, will be, um, for i big, will be in this picture, I'll show you. Um, i big um, will be like here. Slope negative again, and therefore stable, because that's a minus sign up there. Okay, so we know that for i big and negative, or i, I negative, it's a stable, and for i really big and positive, it's, un, it's stable also. And it's going to turn out that for in between i, we have a picture that looks like this. Okay, there's going to be a point I1 and a point I2, and everywhere above I1, or everywhere above I2, this is stable, and everywhere below I1, it's unstable, or stable, and everywhere in between, it's unstable. So I'll draw unstable. as a dashed line, okay? So what happens? What happens in this case? What could possibly happen? We have no stable equilibrium. So here we are. We have no stable equilibrium. What happens? Any idea? Okay, I have a, another theorem for you, a couple of theorems, okay? First theorem is a really cool theorem, and it's really hard to prove, okay? Have you guys ever heard of the Jordan Curve Theorem? Jordan Curve Theorem is why people think math make, you know, 
The Jordan curve theory reminds you of a joke, okay? These guys are in a balloon. Okay, you know, one of those kind of floating balloons. And they're kind of lost. And the one guy, they see somebody below and they say, where are we? And the guy says, we're up there. And the one guy in the balloon says to the other guy, that guy's a mathematician. How do you know? Because everything he says is completely correct, but utterly useless. Okay, so, so, so the point, the Jordan curve theorem says that every closed simple curve in the plane divides the plane into an inside and an outside. What farmer didn't know that, right? <laughs> Come on. Okay, but it's a really hard theorem to prove. But the Jordan curve theorem has a profound consequence for planar systems. Planar systems, in planar systems, it says the behavior as t goes to infinity of any bounded solutions to a planar system has to either turn at an equilibrium point or a periodic orbit. Okay? That's a famous theorem called the poincare ben dixon theorem. Okay? And it says every bounded trajectory or solution to a differential equation either asymptotically goes to an equilibrium point or to a limit cycle. So it simplifies the behavior of this. So what does that mean for us? Okay. Well, remember our differential equations. Pose in, remember, n infinity goes between 0 and 1. Suppose n is bigger than 1. Then what is dn dt? It's negative, right? It has to be negative, right? And suppose that n is 0, then dn dt is positive, right? See that? So let me, let me draw a little picture here. I'm going to draw a little box here. So this is, oh. this is the line n equals 0. That's the line n equals 1. Okay. So we just said if n was less than 0, then dn dt is positive. In fact, if n is equal to 0, dn dt has to be positive, right? Because n infinity is always bigger than 0. So that means that the picture looks like this. This isn't a null line. It just means things have to go in that way because dn dt is positive. dn dt is negative here. Right? So it has to go in. Now, let's take a look. Suppose that v is equal to ek. Okay? Then this is positive. This is positive. And this is, phi is not too bad, this is positive too, right? So if we draw the line V equals EK, dV dt is positive, right? So things have to go in this way, right? Now, if V is equal to E and A, then this is 0. This is a big negative number. This is a negative number. And if i isn't too huge, then dv dt is negative. Certainly, if v is big enough, dt is negative. Okay? So that means that over here, dv dt is negative. So we have, in, in the US, there used to be this product called Roach Motel, okay? Roach Motel was a box with some attractive bait in it, and the roaches would go in, 
but then they couldn't get out. So Roach Motel, they check in, but they don't check out, okay? So we have a Roach Motel here. Once a trajectory starts in here, it can't get out, okay? This is a bounded region. So every trajectory in here has to remain bounded. Okay. Now, if this equilibrium point is unstable, it's an unstable in two directions. It's an unstable spiral, right? So we can draw a little circle around here, and everything has to leave that circle, okay? You see that? So now, if we take this box and cut a hole in here around this equilibrium point, everything in the remaining region, you have to stay in that region forever. You can't leave it. There's no equilibrium points in here, are there? And the poingray Bendixian theorem tells you that the only thing that it can go to is a periodic orbit. So that means there must be what's called a limit cycle here, a large, stable, periodic orbit. So we know that if we inject enough current to destabilize this equilibrium point, then the, action, the neuron has to fire repetitively. Okay? It's an action potential. Here, it's like this. See if I can do this. This is a really cool problem, and anybody who wants to work on this, I would love to hear from you. Okay. Wait, let's see. That's a... You see that? That's a limit cycle. Wait. Oh, this truck isn't. Ah, darn it. On some blackboards, like in, in Pittsburgh, the blackboards work really crappy. And so they're not new, they haven't been there. See, stick slip, uh, discontinuous dynamical system. It stick, slip, stick. It's an oscillation. It's really cool to model that too. Anyway, it's dry friction. So what happens is we know past here, there's got to be a large periodic orbit, okay? We just got that from the poincare bendix theorem, okay? So I can draw a little. In here, there's a periodic solution. Remember, this axis is voltage, okay? So voltage is zipping around here like that, right? So the only question is what happens around here? How do we get from this limit cycle down to this equilibrium, okay? So locally, what have we seen? As we change the current, we go from two negative real part complex conjugate eigenvalues to two positive real part. So there's another theorem, okay? State that theorem right now. Um, I don't think I need the, I don't need the equations on there anymore, do I? No? Theorem. Okay? And this is a general theorem. Okay? So let's suppose we have x dot equals f of x p, where p is a parameter. Okay? And x is. Okay? And let. Suppose. There exists a curve of equilibria okay, with f of x naught of p comma p equals zero. Okay. Let a of p 
be the derivative of f, evaluate it at that, okay? Setting this theorem up is a little bit complicated. Suppose Suppose it has a pair of eigenvalues, alpha of p plus or minus i of p, okay? okay? And suppose, we can erase this now. As p changes, Alpha of P naught equals zero and omega of P naught not zero. And D alpha uh, and alpha of P less than zero for P less than P naught and alpha of P greater than zero for P greater than P naught. And in fact, you really want D alpha DP at p equals p naught is greater than zero. Okay, so that means zip through there, okay? Then, there exists a quantity gamma, a number gamma, okay? that depends only on F and its derivatives up to order three at P naught and x of p naught. So you just take derivatives of f at exactly at that point. Okay? Oh well. <laughs> Such that if real gamma is not zero, gamma is a complex number, then there exists a small amplitude limit cycle or periodic orbit. or P near P naught. Or here, I'll say for P near P naught and either P less than P naught or P greater than P naught, but not both. Okay? Really cool theorem. This is called the Hopf bifurcation theorem. Now, everything in this calculation is really, really easy except for one thing. Okay? This part's real easy. Just find the eigenvalues of A. Okay? Find the equilibria, find the eigenvalues of A. Gamma is a real hard pain in the neck. Okay? 
Never give it to a student as an exercise. It takes pages and pages of horrible calculations and they'll always get it wrong. All right, but I want to point out a little bit more about the limit cycle, okay? And this is a fun exercise, okay? In fact, in fact, x of t equals x naught of p naught, okay? Plus z of t e to the i omega naught t um, v, oh, let me write it this way, real, okay? In fact, x of t looks like the equilibrium point plus this thing. Z is a scalar, I'll tell you about that in a second. V is A of P naught V equals I omega naught V. It's the eigenvector corresponding to that. This is the real part. And Z satisfies this differential equation. DZ dt equals Z times C P minus P naught plus gamma Z, Z bar, okay? Where gamma is as above, hard to calculate, and C equals D by, it, it, C equals um, alpha prime of P naught plus I omega naught prime of P naught. There we go. Okay. So it's just a complex. So here's a really fun, super cool homework exercise. Okay. Analyze this equation. So I'm going to help you out a little bit. We have seven minutes. Yeah, good. All right. So I'm going to help you out a little bit, and then we'll. I've just erased. Them. We'll fill in this bifurcation diagram, or you'll do that today with Prane. Okay. But this is this has a name for it. It's called the normal form for the Hopf bifurcation. Now this is also called the Andronov bifurcation because a Russian guy also discovered it. Okay? And Poincaré actually knew about this too. So some properly, it's the Poincaré Andronov hop bifurcation. But we in the West, we didn't like the Russians and nobody likes the French, so we call it the hop bifurcation. Even though Hopf was not a really savory character, he was one of the only people that went back to Germany when Hitler came to power. <laughs> so, not a great guy. Anyway, but, all right, so here's the thing. Here's, here's the way to, remember, P is a real parameter, okay? So what I want you to do is analyze the behavior of this. Now, it looks, this is complex, okay? So you could write it as a real thing, but it's much easier to do this, right? So I'm gonna write it like this. I'm gonna do, um, where'd my eraser go? Iris, okay? Let's write C equal CR plus ICM, real part plus imaginary part, okay? And write, Gamma equal gamma R 
plus I gamma M, okay? And now write Z equal rho e to the I theta, okay? So you can write a complex number. You know enough of that, right? You know complex numbers, right? You write rho e to the i theta. So let's differentiate this. dz dt equals rho t e to the i theta plus i rho theta t e to the i theta, right? Right? Everybody cool with that? And that's equal to rho e to the i theta, because there's z, times cr plus icm, p minus p naught, plus gamma r plus i gamma m, rho squared. Because zz bar, the thetas go away, okay? Okay? Now, take the real, oh, and now divide through by e to the i theta. Isn't that a miraculous? And take the real and imaginary parts, and you get rho t equals rho times cr p minus p naught plus gamma r rho squared. If you don't believe me, you can do it yourself. Just taking the real and imaginary parts. And theta t equals cm p minus p naught plus gamma m rho squared. Okay? So now, to study this, you want, remember that z is rho e to the i theta. So if theta goes to some constant times t, and rho goes to a constant, then z of t will be a periodic function, right? And you have this periodic function times this guy, you'll get another period, this, you get a periodic function here, slightly different period, because remember z is e to the i theta t, theta, so this is just e to the i omega t plus theta, plus i theta, and if theta is just some constant times t, then it's just got a slightly different period than you started with, and it's got an amplitude rho. So you're, so now this is a linear, this is a nonlinear system, but it's easy. Equilibrium for rho are easy, you just have to solve this guy. Rho equals zero is no good because that's no periodic orbit at all, right? Because that's nothing here, right? So you want to find when there's a value of rho, which satisfies this. Rho has to be real, okay? And then you want to do the stability analysis for this. It's easy because you take the linearization. So what you'll find is that if gamma r is negative, then there is a stable periodic orbit. And if gamma r is positive, there's an unstable periodic orbit. And it depends, if gamma r is negative and CR is positive, then P has to be bigger than P naught, has to be zero, and so on. There's, you know, all those four permutations. Okay? And then if rho goes to a constant, then this just goes to some constant, right? This will just be equal to k. And so theta t will be kt 
And you plug that in, e to the i, omega t. Oh, oh, it's time to stop. All right, so there's, I've really helped you through all the exercise to, use, to fill in the details, okay? All right, so I guess it's time to stop. So tomorrow, I will introduce class two, or class one, excitability and um, homoclinics, all right? But for now, this is the hop, all right? And I guess it's time to stop. <laughs>